Good morning. All right, so without further ado, um, we will go ahead and get today's session started. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the most spectacular CTSO advisors I've ever worked with. Um, she has um, accomplished great things um, leading both a DECA and FBLA chapter um, at her former school, Walker Valley House High School, but she has now brought her talents to Middle Tennessee and she will be serving um, at Smyrna High School out in Rutherford County. Um, Becky Brady is accomplished. She's extremely um, knowledgeable of integrating CTSOs into the classroom and just utilizing so many different resources to better reach the students that we serve here in Tennessee. And so I think today's session will prove why she's leading the session because she's truly an incredible CTE teacher and CTSO advisor. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to turn you over to none other than Miss Becky Brady. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. And I usually don't get nervous when I present, but today seems to be a little different and I don't know why, but that's okay. So um, it is my pleasure to be here today to talk to you guys a little bit about something that I'm passionate about, and that is projects within the classroom and how to get our kids active in our CTSOs. And it doesn't matter what area of CTSO or CTE that you might be in. I hope that you can take away something today that's practical, that's um, something that you can jump in and use. With all of us facing the unknown of being maybe to um, having to go virtual at any moment, I hope that this gives you something that you can fall on immediately and post and be able to utilize for your kids. Um, as Stephen said, I have been at Walker Valley for the last 13 years and I'm transitioning to Middle Tennessee and I will be here in Rutherford County at Smyrna in the fall. And so um, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, here is the actual um, information about what you guys read when we got started and how you guys clicked and selected this. I hope this brings you some real world connections um, in that our kids can see why it is important to be a part of our CTSO and why the projects that we assign throughout our courses are actually important and give them real world skills that they can take away and be a part of. So the goals of today, um, I just want to give you something that you can have tangibly in your hands to walk away with. You're gonna find out that the assessment strategies are actually already built in for you. Um, and this gives you a chance to actually sometimes reach out to your community partners. I don't know if we're going to be able to have those in our classrooms this year or not, but maybe you can set up virtual interviews for your kids or have them uh, pop into live Zoom meetings at different points. You can get them into your classroom virtually still by using your CTSO and all of the projects that you're going to see today. Um, this helps you maybe to take a big project or several standards that are going to be in your um, courses and be able to break those down into what I call, you can eat an elephant one bite at a time. And so this gives you a chance to be able to do some of that. And it also is gonna give you the chance to prepare your students for competitions while you are meeting the needs and the skills and the assessments there in your classroom. So when you're looking at projects and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need to give my kids something to do tangibly within the classroom that falls back and helps to tie into your standards. Um, you know, you have to look at things on the big picture and then break them down and look at how you can combine multiple things into one area or one project. Um, and so what you do is you evaluate the need for your projects and you do that based on your standards um, you're going to look at what is defined as a project. You know, some people think that projects have to be big or small or um, they can be all kinds of different things. They can take five minutes, they can take five days, they can take five weeks. 
kind of depends on what you need and what standards you're trying to cover. Um, we're going to look at how to develop those projects, where to gain your resources, and then the implementation of it as well. So you need to know three th things basically in order to begin. One of those um, happens to be your standards. And if you're like me, I'm changing schools, so I'm going from one set of standards classes that I teach to different classes. And so um, in business, I might have one class that I teach all day long, or I might have four classes that I teach. And so I want to dig into those standards, look at the skills, look at the knowledge, what needs to be produced in order to show mastery of that understanding. Once I have that information laid out in front of me, I'm going to actually turn to my CTSO guidelines. Those can be found electronically. Lots of times your organizations will mail you a booklet that will have all of that broken down for you. In those guides and in those guidelines are specific things that will actually tie back to the national standards that will point you to the standards that it correlates with in the classes that you're actually teaching. And then look at the timeline. Now this is gonna be different for everybody depending on whether you're on traditional block, modified block, modified traditional, all of those things are gonna be different for each one of you. So I can't tell you that this will take one day, this will take five days. You're gonna to have to kind of dive into the water and tread for a few minutes until you can kind of figure that out. But you wanna look at the big picture of your class. What are the big things that you want to accomplish? How fast are you gonna to have to go through those skills and knowledge components in order to get to these projects? Um, and how do you want to lay it out? Um, and then make yourself a pacing guide. If you're in a district or a school system where you can actually have those shared pacing guides, get together with a couple of your other teachers and be like, hey, where does this fit? How can we put this in here? Will this go from day 12 to 15? Or how will we incorporate that in? Once you have those three pieces kind of laid out in front of you, you're then ready to begin. So, like I said a minute ago, when you're looking at what is defined as a project, um, it's anything that a student can produce, basically. And that can be written, oral, tangible, intangible. And guess what, guys? It doesn't have to be big. Like, it can be a one-minute elevator speech. And, those, and they can create those in, like, five seconds. And believe it or not, there are actually assessment guides on FBLA, which covers all of your uh, career clusters, for an elevator speech. And so there are some of those things that you can look at and, and feel like, you know what, that is something that my kids can produce. And I'll be honest with you, most kids cannot stand and carry on conversation because they are have their heads glued to their phones. And so when it comes to being able to talk and communicate, that's one of the skills that they actually need help on and be able to tie into that. And it can be something they give to a peer, it can be something they give to the class, it can be something they can give to you just something small, tangible, um, that they can actually walk away and be like, hey, I actually did that. I can actually talk to somebody about who I am and, and about my career cluster or about my class or about you know, my competition, uh, whatever it might be. So like I said, guys, don't overthink this. Don't think that it has to be a six weeks project that you have to assign somebody. Um, when you're thinking about looking at how to incorporate more projects within your curriculum. So in your standards, um, you want to make sure and look at um, what needs to be showed in order for mastery to be completed. Um, and once you see what those are, sometimes our standards are very specific in what that needs to look like. Sometimes those are given to us as best practices. Um, and so it's one of those things where the more you dive into your standards, the more you will understand what that component looks like. And then sometimes you just have all the flexibility in the world as to what that needs to look like. Um, and then once you look at that and you dove into your resource guide on your CTSO, and I'm gonna show you where to find that on the FBLA site in just a few minutes, so that you can understand kind of what to look for and what you need to be um, trying to, to get your kids in order to, to get there. Um, you're gonna decide on your time frame. decide if you want an individual partner or a team project. Now, sometimes our competitions are just individual competitions when the kids go to compete at the district, state, or national level. Well, 
in the classroom, you can actually make that a group project if you wanted to, if you need to, to speed up your time frame, or if you needed to, you know, if you've got a student who is struggling with some of the skills or the knowledge, you can pair them up with other students and, and be able to help them kind of peer teach as they go through this. And you might be surprised at some of the things that your kids will pick up along the way. A, they're getting to teach somebody and B, they're learning from a peer. And so it brings back some of those um, activity levels where they can, can be to, together and um, kind of decide, you know, moving on, hey, this is something I do want to compete in or no, I don't. And you may find out that the kid who had, um, had the highest mastery on the project doesn't want to compete, but the kid that they helped feels confident enough to compete and that will actually give that student the ability to take their skills to the next level and gain some, um, some soft skills to take forward. And then you just want to implement. Um, it's basically how, um, how you choose to implement projects in your classroom, whether you're all paper, whether you're all digital, that's completely up to you. I found out the last couple of years in utilizing um, learning platforms that you can post all the directions in the world and kids are still going to have questions about, well, how do you do this? Well, how do you do that? And so that's where you as a teacher will then step in and be able to utilize um, classroom techniques that you already have in front of you to help implement these projects. So you want to make sure that as you go through these projects that you're looking for your core skills and knowledge. As the students progress through these projects, make sure that you have um, checkpoints for them so that they can um, be able to step back and make sure that the skills and the knowledge are where they need to be. And it may, you may find out that they get through step one or step two that, you know what, I need to go back and reteach something or I need to go back and help clarify a point that they may need going forward. You always want to introduce your project. Now, how you do that is going to be based on who you are as a teacher and what you feel comfortable doing. Um, sometimes I actually show them a video of what a competition might look like. Or I actually give a presentation based on what I expect for them to see. Um, I had a couple of student teachers who have in the past who have used that as teaching moments where they actually compile a project based on one of these and then they present it and then they talk through it. And so they kind of do a backward approach to the teaching method, which is which worked out really good for them and the students got to see the big picture and then break it down into chunks. As a good teacher, we always know that we have to monitor and adjust students as they work through their projects. Um, I, after 17 years of teaching, I have found out that monitoring and adjusting becomes 90% of what I do. Everything looks good on paper and then real life happens and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, so let's do this. Let's change this up. Let's add this here. Okay, let's take an extra day. You know, you just have to learn to monitor and adjust as you go through um, these projects. So we're going to look at an example. Um, this one actually comes from FBLA and this one will actually work for all career clusters. And it's called the Electronic Career Portfolio. Um, I actually had a couple of students um, in the past who have done really good at the state level um, with this competition. And I've found out that this is in every class that I teach. There's some type of career research, career planning that takes place. And so what you guys are going to see is something that you can physically take back and tangibly put into place now. What you see at the top is the actual standard that um, came out of one of my classes um, on the business side. And you will notice that it looks at um, the breakdown of all those career clusters um, information that students are trying to find out, you know, um, what education has to go into it, what um, recommended years of experience, what certifications are required, what's the salary and benefits, what are the roles and responsibilities outlined in like a vacancy announcement. So all of those things come out of that career standard within my course. And so what you see down here are actual two 
screenshots of what I'm going to look for when I go to the CTSO website. Um, and so I'm going to escape out of this and I'm actually going to go to that website here in FBLA, and I chose FBLA because this one's a little bit easier to, to get to as far as this competition is concerned. And so I just go to divisions and it's always FBLA, competitive events. And this is where knowing what your competitions look like and knowing what your actual um, guidelines and standards look like, this gives you a chance to kind of dive into some of that. So I'm going to scroll down here. It has all of the uh, competitions kind of laid out. The electronic career portfolio actually falls underneath presentation with equipment. And here it has them all broke down. This one kind of never changes every year unless they do an update to it, which is one of the reasons I kind of like to use this one. Sometimes you never know what the topic might be and it changes from year to year. This is one of those that stays um, constant. This gives you all of the event guidelines. This gives you what the students are expected to present, to have at the time. It gives you all of the eligibility. It gives you all of the um, guidelines for what is gonna take place. And I'll be honest with you, this timeline component right here is actually how I expect my students to present to me their final piece. Yes, they will upload their final um, produced component of this, but when they actually stand up and present to me, I make them go by what is here. Um, and we just, and it's one of those deals, like I'm prepping them for competition as they are actually performing in the classroom. And so it's one of those ways that um, I can help prepare them for competition, but also prepare them for what may happen in college or in a career or later on in another project that might come up. Here on this screen, you have a lot of different um, options to, to look at. You can print it, and when you go to print it, you all know that you can not actually print the paper, but you can save it as a PDF. What happens then is then you can post it into your learning platform. So if you're all online this semester, this gives you the chance to take those guidelines. You don't have to retop it. You don't have to recreate it. It's all there for you. And then all you do is then you um, take it and you post it into your learning platform. And then that gives the students the ability to always reference back these guidelines of what is expected. Now, just because I post the guidelines doesn't mean that I'm still not going to do my in-classroom lecturing or teaching or, or whatever needs to be done um, as far as that is concerned. Okay, so this is the part that tells the students um, exactly what is expected, what are they looking for, exactly. and all of those wonderful pieces that are here. If you will see, it says career-related education, educational enhancement, examples exactly. of special skills. Um, yes. Um, can you switch over to the screen that you want them to see? The only thing they can see right now is the PowerPoint still. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Is that better? All good. Can everybody now. see the um, screen? Yes, we can see you scrolling. Okay, great. Thank Sorry you. about that. And um, so here, how I got here, I'll go back and show you guys that. So here under divisions, competitive events, and then electronic career portfolio is a presentation with equipment. And then I just click on the hyperlink and then it took me to the actual page. This has all of the guidelines on it. If you scroll down through here, it has your timeline as far as presentation is concerned. Um, it has more information about the actual competition itself. But here at the bottom has a format guide that would help um, 
you when it comes to have, having students be able to um, look at what needed to be turned in. And then also the rating sheet, which is super important because this is actually your assessment guide. Now, sometimes I look at some of this information and be like, okay, we're gonna do this separately. So like the resume may be turned in as a different grade. Um, the research may be turned in as a separate grade. So as I get ready to look at the performance rating, then I'm not gonna count those two in based on what is going on um, as far as what they're gonna produce for me in the classroom. And so what that happens, um, down here it gives you a total. And if you have like a community partner who's coming in and giving feedback to your students, this gives them something that they might see if they were going to actually judge at the district or at the state level. Um, and we all know that finding those judges is super important to our students, but also this gives us the ability to um, prepare them for competitions. And as a teacher, I don't have to create a rubric. It's already created for me. And I can post this in the learning platform for students so that they can see what is expected of them um, when they get ready to do that final component, that final presentation. back and so back here in the presentation those two screenshots are what we just looked like uh, looked at on the FBLA side um, and you will see that this becomes the assessment the rubric which you had access to and then the timeline gives you the chance to have students understand what is expected as far as when they're standing in front of the class or if you want them to video it. You know, if we are all vir if we are virtual, they all have a cell phone or they have a computer that they're communicating communicating with. So they have the ability to actually do their presentations and record it and then turn around and submit it and upload it to you. Um, you know, you can have students submit completed projects um, in segments as one big component, as one big piece. Um, the choice is up to you and kind of how you want to break it down. How do you want them to um, see things going forward? Um, but the great thing is, is a lot of your learning platforms, you have the ability to go in and actually see where they're at and give immediate feedback, which is great. Um, you can have students video their presentations during class time. Lots of students will actually like to do that. Um, they like to do practice runs um, on their presentations. And so um, you can have students video each other and then upload if, if you have a student who's going to be absent for something later on. Or if they're nervous about it, this gives them a chance to look to see what it looks like and for them to hear it and to practice it. Um, you can pick which ones need further progress in order to compete. So as students are presenting, you can take your best and then be able to go, hey, I think that, you know, you've got some great feedback here from your, your fellow classmates, from any community partners that may be involved. Um, you know what, I think that you need to compete this. Um, and so it gives you the chance to prep them while they're taking that real tangible skills and knowledge and applying it. Um, the national websites has access to previous competitors, and I'll be honest with you, YouTube does as well. Um, I know some of those YouTube videos aren't legal per se, but at least they have the ability to, for students to see what could be, and there are some videos out there of what shouldn't be. And so that gives you the chance to maybe even bring that up while you're doing your um, lecturing or while you're doing your teaching moment. And then use the provided rubric in order to grade your presentations. If you get your students accustomed to the rubrics that the state and national um, competitive events will use, this allows them to prepare mentally for what they're going to need moving forward. And as a teacher, that's one piece that I don't have to create because it's already created for me. So the takeaways would be to know your standards, to know your CTSO website and competitive events. And if you're like me, now's the time that I am sitting around going, okay, 
I know that there's this event that applies to that standard. How can I make the two connect? And so while I'm trying to lay some of those pieces out, I'm diving into my websites. I'm looking at uh, my standards, finding out the correlation between the two. Um, you don't have to invent a project for every standard. Just utilize the tools that are already provided. Sometimes I get um, finding out that my students don't need practice in one area, but they do in another. And so we do our skills and knowledge in that area, and then we transition and tie it in over here, and we pull things together. I don't do projects for every unit. I don't do projects for every standard. I pick and choose what I want my students to have the core knowledge that's needed. And sometimes your standards will actually pinpoint those out to you. Um, if you look, and sometimes it gives you those best practices. And um, there's all kinds of resources that are available for you. I know with COVID, one of the better things that has come out of that is the fact that free resources were thrown at us constantly between March, April, and May. So many that I was just like, whoa, my head kind of exploded. And so I just kind of was just like, okay, I'm gonna step back and kind of look at some of this later on. But now's the time to be looking at those resources because as we go into an area of unknown, those resources are gonna be there for us to be able to pull in so our kids can have those projects, can have those tangible and intangible um, assessments to move forward. And here's the thing. I've been teaching for 17 years and a lot of you that are on here today have a lot more experience than I do. Don't be afraid to borrow projects from each other and tweak what you need to tweak. You're, we are all different in the classroom. That's what makes us unique and makes us special at what we do. But just because I teach differently than you doesn't mean that I can't use that project that's out there. And so I just take it and I make it my own and I have the ability to um, do what's needed and necessary to fit my students, to fit my curriculum, to fit my needs for where I'm at at the moment. Um, and so if you, if anybody has any questions, um, we'll take those now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you can, Put your questions in the chat feature and I'll try to field through the questions. We do have right at about 15 minutes remaining. And so any questions that go unanswered, um, I believe Becky may be providing her contact information at the conclusion of this session. So if your question is not answered, uh, please don't be dismayed. We'll try our very best to get some answers to you um, shortly after today's session at some point this week. So I will be going through the chat feature, looking for questions, and Becky, I'll relay them to you. Um, let's see here. First question I see is, do you have any suggestions on how to start up an FBLA chapter that will encourage students to join? There are so many um, CTSOs for students to choose from, what are some good promotional ideas to get them involved? Um, great question. Stephen, you might want to jump in here on that one. Um, after 17 years of being an advisor for CTSO, I found out that as things change within education, my CTSO has changed. And so I'm recruiting more and more from my classrooms and I try to show how students can take away that real tangible knowledge of what they're doing in the classroom and actually apply it. That's one way that I've been trying to do that. Another way is I use the free promotional items that are on the national websites. They put all that out um, about end of July, first of August. Um, I know we start school here in August. <coughs> and so, um, that has the ability to um, kind of hinder some of that. Sorry. <coughs> Not used to talking. Stephen, do you want to take over for a second? Um, well, I think you're sending <laughs> in the right direction. Um, all of our seven recognized CTSOs um, here in Tennessee 
think all of the national <laughs> um, do a very stellar job in providing resources that will um, assist you with recruiting. Uh, for example, I know that DECA offers what is called the DECA Guide. FBLA has a chapter management handbook um, that are available for chapter advisors to kind of, you know, go through and, and figure out ways to better recruit and to make sure that we are staying current and relevant in the eyes of our students that we serve. Um, I think right now, especially given um, the uncharted territory that we're in with the, the pandemic and um, so many districts leaning toward virtual learning, I think this is really an excellent opportunity for us as CTSOs to uh, tap into a different market of students because um, students who were probably conflicted with band and, and athletics that might not necessarily be able to participate in those activities as they've done in the past, I think this is a great way for us to say, well, hey, you might not necessarily be able to um, be all in with band this year or, or all in with football or basketball or whatever extracurricular activities uh, you typically involve yourselves in. But this is something that's, you know, it's co-curricular. Um, students can learn about DECA, can learn about Skills USA in the classroom. And what I would do is um, I would celebrate the fact that um, in normal circumstances, uh, one of the biggest sales with CTSO recruitment was to be able to let students know that we can take them outside of the four, the four walls of the classroom. Now, we have to be a little bit more creative with that right now, but um, I, I'm just a hopeful, optimistic person, so I'm hoping that uh, more sooner than later, uh, we'll be able to provide students with more of those opportunities to network and meet industry professionals outside of their school building because we can teach them from the textbook all day long. We can help them thumb through pages all day long. We can do mock role plays and do all kinds of things within the classroom. But when they are able to sit in front of an industry professional who is in the career that they are aspiring to join, it's a game changer. And so um, being able to connect them to those business leaders, I think is what helps us to uh, recruit students more and being able to the fact that they can travel and meet people outside of their home schools, their home chapters. I think that's um, a great way to start your recruitment process. Um, let's go to another question. Becky, it looks like a lot of people are asking to have a copy of your PowerPoint. Um, so I'm sure she'll probably upload that in the file section. And I think it typically takes about 24 hours for that to be accessible. Um, so just check back and look under the files tab, which is right here next to the chat feature, chat people, polls, and files. And you should be able to see her PowerPoint at some point tomorrow. Um, let's see here. Let's see. Do you encourage? Okay, here's a good question uh, from Christopher. Bissinger, uh, he wants to know, do you encourage projects that are in school based or should students try and get experience out in the community? That's a good question. Actually, um, I choose to do both. Depending on the level of the course depends on whether it's in classroom or in the community. So <clears throat> like one of my entry level courses, I would be making sure that that's in the classroom. One of those uh, upper level courses like a practicum, entrepreneurship, uh, financial planning, any of those types of classes, I would be trying to find a way to bring community or get them in the community. Um, to piggyback on that, I think community involvement is key in my honest opinion. I think that's a great way to make sure that folks outside of our school buildings, they understand the value of Skills USA and they want to work with HOSA and they see the potential of our students that they serve. And so anytime we can put our students in front of community leaders and business leaders so that they can form a partnership of some kind, 
um, and they figure out ways. These students are extremely creative and students have the ability to uh, provide a service to some of these community leaders, some of these industry leaders. I think that opens the door to so many more and bigger partnerships for your local chapter. You know, that's how you can help recruit judges. Um, that's how you can help um, put the students in front of um, industry professionals when it's time to start practicing for competition. Um, it's one thing to practice in front of their teacher, but if you have a relatively medium sized to large chapter and you know, you're a one or two teacher program, you're gonna need the help of other industry leaders. And so the more you can connect with the community, I think the more successful your chapter will be. So great question. Um, let's see here. Still going through. Um, okay, Jordan Conley has asked, fundraising will be tough this coming school year for chapters, especially if we are away from campus. Any ideas or, or suggestions on ways we can help our students afford the cost on being in these competitions? Great question, because that's going into a new school. That's one of the questions that I actually have right now um, is how are we going to fundraise? <clears throat> but then becomes the question, are we even going to be able to travel? So how much funds are we going to need to be able to even generate moving forward? So um, <clears throat> maybe somebody in the chat has a good answer for that, but I'm, I'm on the same board trying to ask that same question myself right now. Um, how are we going to fundraise? What does that look like? What, you know, because what we've done in the past is probably not going to work because if you're like me, we were selling Little Debbie cakes on Fridays or we would do special events where the kids would buy tickets and get out of class during activity period. We're not going to have that option this year. So <clears throat> I'm really not sure what a good answer is for that. I think that's something that we may have to tap into to different groups, different teachers and be like, hey, what are you doing? Is it working? And that may be one of the times that you need to network with other people in your area or maybe within your own CTSO. Got a, another question that appears to come from a few different people. Um, let's see. Becky, is there a particular online platform that you recommend for hosting electronic portfolios? That has actually changed um, over time. My kids used to just use PowerPoint or Prezi or something to that extent to do their electronic portfolios. Um, in Bradley County Schools, we were a Google district. So my kids would either use um, <clears throat> Google Slides, PowerPoint, or they would actually do Google Sites um, where they could actually make it like almost a web page type deal um, and take it virtual that way. So it kind of just depends on what tools that you have um, at your disposal as to what will work. You know, there's nothing wrong with a PowerPoint that they can set transitions automatically and move. There's nothing wrong with a Google slide that they can, that can work their way through. You don't have to have the fanciest technology in order to make it look good and professional. That's just something that the kids actually need to learn um, that you can take basic and make it fabulous and be able to move forward with it. Um, I'm just adding this. It looks like Courtney Vance has shared a success story. Um, she said, he or she, sorry, said that in their district, they are going to be looking at fundraisers that will be largely internet-based purchases or items that can be utilized through gift certificates. I think that's a great idea. Um, they have a local photographer that partners um, with them and it seems to be successful so far. Uh, so maybe those, um, I don't know if they still do like the coupon books and things like that, um, you know, but I think internet, internet based purchases and fundraisers are probably going to be most helpful, at least going into the fall semester. 
Nathaniel Hudson has also shared that his district has gone to Office 365. Um, so Sway could be an option that's going back to the hosting platform for those of you who were interested in knowing how students could host their electronic career portfolios, regardless of the CTSO you affiliate with. Um, Lori, I see your question about uh, whether or not the national offices have made any hints on what will take place this year. Um, to be honest with you, I think a lot of the CTSO national offices are still very much so deliberating on what we can and cannot do. Um, right now, what I'm noticing is that so many states are doing so many different things. And then right here in our home state, so many different districts are doing so many different uh, different things. You know, just looking at the top two um, districts in terms of size, Shelby County versus Metro Nashville, um, their procedures for this fall are quite different. And so it's making it a, a bit challenging to forecast what we can do and what we won't be able to do. I think we're just kind of, you know, figuring it out here. I know that's where I am with Tennessee DECA and FBLA. Um, just been having one-off conversations with several advisors from all over the state to see exactly what you all feel is going to be possible. Um, I think what's going to be key here is having an open mind and not throwing in the towel, so to speak. Uh, we still have to figure out a way to integrate um, our CTSOs into our classroom instruction. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to be as creative as possible and, and keep the, the students engaged as possible. Because um, right now, you know, when you think about, let's say, a, a typical 10th grader, you know, he or she is very likely uh, going to be sitting in a virtual classroom for biology, for uh, chemistry, for AP English, for this, for that. How do we as CTE educators give students a slightly different or largely different experience as best as we can. So I think it's going to be great for us to explore creativity and, and welcome um, different ways of doing things. So let's see here. We've got one minute left. I see two hands raised. Let's see if I can. All right. I'm going to open you up, Paula Ubala. I see that you have a question. You have the floor. Uh, that was actually during the presentation. I raised my hand because oh. we couldn't see. Yeah, so oh, sorry about that. No okay. worries. Okay. Okay, Sean Tester. I see your hand raised. I don't know if you're in the same boat as Paul. If you are, just let us know. I was wondering what the keyword was. The golden question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Becky, do you want to share that, or um, are we in a good closing spot? In yeah, we're we're there. Um, the key word is burrito. Okay, something Thank that I want right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm getting ready to go eat. So that's yeah. why I was wanting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Well, we appreciate everyone's attention and participation. This morning, thank you, Becky, for hosting us and for sharing all of your wealth of knowledge. Um, I think there is a follow-up session this afternoon. So if you are looking to continue this conversation, that session begins at one o'clock this afternoon. So yes. for your lunch, continue to be safe and hopefully we will see you all in person one day soon. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.